the Johnson Wax Program, Words at War, with Carl Van Doren. The makers of Johnson's Wax for Home and Industry, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, proudly presents one of the most widely discussed programs in America, Words at War, dramatizations of the most representative books to come out of this great world conflict. We're very proud to, we're very happy to have as an important feature of our series, a man who really knows good books. All of you, I'm sure, are familiar with his name, for he's one of America's leading literary figures, the eminent author, biographer, and Pul Pulitzer Prize winner, Mr. Carl Van Doren. Here is Mr. Carl Van Doren. Thank you. Well, it's very nice for me to be here this evening and to have this chance to talk to you Johnson Wax listeners. For a great number of years, I've been with you regularly. Pippa McGee and Molly is one of my favorite radio programs. It's very satisfying, too, that the program which is to replace them for the summer months, a program in which I am to have a part, is Words at War. That, too, has been a favorite of mine ever since it was started by the National Broadcasting Company some time ago. Words at War is more important than ever in this great summer of America's life. Our hands and our heads and our hearts are all at war, and so are our words. The free words of free men have always been weapons that tyrants dread as they dread almost no others. Tonight's story is called Fair Stood the Wind for France. It's a new novel that made a great impression on me when I read it, and I'd like to tell you something about it and its author when Jack Costello has said a word in behalf of our sponsor. Perhaps it isn't customary for a company to talk about its radio commercials with you, its radio audience. Yet I, for one, think it's a good idea, and the makers of Johnson's Wax have asked me on this initial program to say a word about their policy. You have invited us into your home as friends, and we appreciate that honor and privilege. Most of you are familiar with Johnson commercials on the Fibber, McGee, and Molly program. They're intended to be friendly in style, brief, and helpful because they are informative. On this new show, we hope you will find the commercial messages about various Johnson's wax products helpful. We assure you they'll be brief, and we all mean them to be friendly. Mr. Van Doren? Fair Stood the Wind for France is, first of all, a fine piece of writing by one of England's brilliant younger novelists, H.E. Bates. Secondly, it is a novel that only a man like Bates could have written with authority, for Bates himself is an RAF intelligence officer and has flown on many a bombing mission over France. France, where an unconquerable people live for a time in defeat under the hated rule of Nazi tyrants. But the forces of resistance, which we call the French underground, never falter and never sleep. Whatever there's a chance to do, they are ready for. But suppose we get on with the story. It begins in a bombing plane on its way home over France on a moonlit night. It is a story told by the man who knows it best, the pilot, John Franklin. Returning from a raid on Italy, and had left the Alps behind now, looking like crisp folds of crumpled cloth under the light of the moon. We were dead tired, the five of us Taylor and Godwin, the youngsters, Sandy, short and bald, O'Connor, the English bred Irishman. We were tense, yet bored too. But most of all, we were tired, tired and silent when it happened. Okay? Everybody okay? Taylor? Okay, Skip. Godwin? Right. Sandy? I think so. O'Connor? What the devil happened, Skip? Sounded like a prop. It was a propeller. Now look, we're not going to make it. I've got to land in the next few minutes. Sandy? Yes, Skip? Where are we? West northwest of the Verge. South of Paris. All right, listen now. Don't do anything cockeyed. Remember everything we've been told, okay? Right, right. Okay. Right, Skip. Hold on, I'm going down.
Now, two days after we'd crashed. We were all right, except that there was a gash in my arm the size of a jackknife, and I'd lost a good deal of blood. We'd crossed a river to put distance between us and the plane, and it hid in a grape arbor for the night. It was after dawn now, and just beyond the arbor, I could see a girl feeding chickens in the yard of a small farm. I decided to go down and ask her for help. The others, Taylor and Godwin, Sandy and O'Connor, were against it. They thought she might report us. I was for risking it, and so I stepped out from the vines and walked toward her. A dozen paces away, she saw me. I stopped. She just looked at me with big, dark, beautiful eyes. I stepped forward again and spoke to her. But myself, I'm English. Yes? Can you help, please? Please, I'm an English flyer. I have my identification. You can see that I'm telling the truth. It's not a trick. Will you look at the identification? Please. Are you alone? There are five of us. We were returning from Italy. I'm the captain and there are four sergeants. They're hiding in the vines. Can you help us? I can hide you in the mill. In the mill? That'll be all right, mademoiselle. Wave to your friends to come down. Yes, thank you, mademoiselle. Your arm is injured. It's all right. You have lost blood? Oh, it's quite all right, mademoiselle. It will need attention. No, please, my friends will take care of it. Oh, here they are, mademoiselle. Mademoiselle will help us. Hello. Mademoiselle will hide us in the mill. Oh. I will go on ahead. Follow me. It's all right, O'Connor. She'll help us. I don't know. It would be easy to tuck us away in the mill and, and then report us. Skip, do you think it's the thing to do? We've got to take a chance, Taylor. We've got to trust her. Yes, I suppose we do now. All right, let's go. We walked toward the mill. I was raging inside, irritated by their mistrust of the girl, yet torn by doubt of her myself. Then I looked at her as she waited for us at the door, standing there looking so sure and strong and, and beautiful. Please, go in. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thanks, sorry. Hmm, musty old place. <clears throat> well, this isn't too bad, huh? Hmm. You will all be all right here. As long as you are in your flying clothes, you must stay here. If anything happens, there is a room below. There is water in it, but you can hide there. Is, uh, is anything likely to happen, mademoiselle? One never knows. Hmm. I will bring you food. You must also have other clothes. You're very kind. Miss, are there others up at the house? My father. It will be all right. You're sure? Yes. She said it would be all right, didn't she? Let's not make it any more difficult skip. than... Skip. Oh, grab him, Taylor. <laughs> I've got it. Easy, Skip, old boy. It is his arm. Oh, be careful. Easy, Skip, old man. He's out cold. We must take him to the house. He must have a doctor. A doctor? How can you get a doctor? He'd report us. It can us. be arranged, monsieur. There will be no danger for your friend. Perhaps it will help you all if I tell you that I had a brother, a flyer in the French army. He was killed before Dunkirk. Oh, forgive us, mademoiselle. Give me a hand, Sandy. Let's get him up to the house. O'Connor. Yes, yes. I'm going to bring her down, O'Connor. Yes, you bring her down. Going down, O'Connor. Hold on, you chaps. We're going down. 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 Um. <clears throat> oh. Hello. How do you feel? All right. Have I been asleep long? This is the third day. Oh, no. Yes. Be... You had a fever. Would you like a cool drink? Oh, yes. Yes, I would. There. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it's good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Have you been here all the time? Yes. Who are you? Francois. Oh. Well, my name is... Yes, I know. John Franklin. 
Your friends have told me. My friends? Where are they? Oh, they're all right. They haven't been... No, 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 no. They're all right. They want to see you. My father, too, wishes to talk to you. Do you feel strong enough? Oh, yes. Get them, please. My father will talk to you while I go to the mill. I will be gone in just a few minutes. Father, the captain is awake now. Very well, Francois. (coughs) Monsieur, I hope you feel better. Yes, I am better. I wish to thank you for all you have done for us. It's nothing, monsieur. I have much to tell you. Yes? While you have been ill, I have been making arrangements in the village. I have obtained papers for you and your friends. We can leave? They can leave, monsieur. It is important that they do leave as quickly as possible. We'll all go together. No. Your arm needs the attention of a doctor, monsieur. Oh, it's all right. I'm all right now. No, monsieur. To put it more blunt, your friends have an opportunity to get to Spain. In your condition... You would do them no service by going with them. Oh. I see. I I can't stay here. It's not fair to you. Doctor, he's coming in the morning, monsieur. If the Germans should find out, it it would mean... I am aware of what it would mean. But, monsieur, believe me, I know what I am doing. What Francois and I are doing is something we wish to do. I am not afraid of the Germans. They will never take me. Huh? Your friends are here. Remember what I have told you, monsieur? Yes. I will leave you now. Yes, goodbye, and thank you. He is waiting for you, monsieur. Yeah, thank, thank you, sir. Well, Skip, I say, you look fit, doesn't he? <laughs> certainly does. <laughs> oh, I'm feeling all right. Skip, that old mill isn't half bad. We've made out fine. Oh, did the old boy tell you? He's got papers for us. He told me. When are you leaving? Leaving? Well, uh, when the doctor gets you fixed up... That'll be no time at all, Skip. Uh, once he stitches his head on, you'll be as good as new. Better than that. Look, you're going on without me. Skip, have you gone for me? No, I... Quiet. Quiet, please. Not a word. Two German soldiers have just come into the yard. What? Oh, no. What do we do? Please. It, it may be just a routine inspection. I lock the door. Quiet now. Not a word. I talk if necessary. Well, I've got my revolver, and by no, God, no, they no, won't... No, 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 monsieur, please. Let's have a look around. What is that stairs? Just sleeping rooms. Well, have a look. Come, Heidi. Well, there's nothing here. Wait a minute. There's a door at the other end there. Ah. Open up, Fräulein. Oh, I am sorry. I'm dressing. Oh. <laughs> you hear that, Hans? She's dressing. <laughs> yes, monsieur. What do you say to that, Hans? Let it go. So? Uh, she's a modest young lady, huh? Let it go, honey. Very well. Goodbye, Fräulein. Perhaps we shall meet again sometime. Then you are dressed. <laughs> Come along, man. Well, I'll be. <laughs> Please, wait. Ah, it's all right. You're going out in the yard. Probably just a census of crops. That was a bit too close. We can't be that close again. O'Connor, you all leave tonight. Oh, oh no, that's not a, a suggestion, men. That's an order. I'm still skipper. Well, of course you are. Get skip. back to the mill as soon as it's safe. Yes, skip. Perhaps I'd better stay in the house tonight uh, to look after Francois. After all, I have a revolver. I have a revolver. I look after her. Well, I just thought I'll do the thinking. You do as you're told, O'Connor. Go back to the mill. Very well, sir. <laughs> They filed out of the room silently. And I felt like a dog for having talked to them that way. Especially O'Connor. And then it came to me and I couldn't believe my own reason. What was this? Was I jealous of O'Connor over a French girl I scarcely knew myself? It didn't make sense. I tried to make it up and they came back later that night to say goodbye. Four men who were closer to me than my own parents. I tried to say something to O'Connor, but it was no use. Yet he seemed to understand as he held my hand and said, Goodbye, Skip. And when they had gone, the tears came. 
and I let them come until I fell asleep. In the morning, the doctor told me, You are a soldier, monsieur. There's no point to my deceiving you. The arm must come off. Off? Yes. Well, can you take... Uh, take can you perform the operation here? It must be here. But, monsieur, I am humiliated to tell you this. I have no anesthetic. Oh, I understand. You should not feel humiliated. I am humiliated for France, where doctors have no anesthetic. It's all right. When will it be done? At once, I'm afraid. It's... It's not easy, doctor. No. No, it is not easy. I will call the girl. Oh, doctor, please, I, I, I'd rather she weren't here. I'm afraid she must be here. I have no one else to assist me. Francois, will you come now, please? For those of you who may have tuned in a little late, this is Carl Van Doren. Tonight on the Johnson Wax program, Words of War, we are presenting a dramatization of one of the month's best-selling novels, Fair Stood the Wind for France. So far, we have followed the adventures of five British flyers who have been forced down in France and have been given shelter by a French peasant and his daughter. Four of the flyers have obtained papers and have gone on in their attempt to escape. But the fifth, John Franklin, the pilot, now is about to have his injured left arm amputated. The doctor readies his instruments in the bedroom of the farmhouse. The girl, Francoise, stands by the bedside, assisting the doctor. It would be better if you did not look, monsieur. Thank you, doctor. Francoise. Hmm? What is that whistle? Just the train. Where does it go? To Marseille. And from there? Across the border to Spain. Could they... Could they be on that train, Francoise? It is possible. Spain. Freedom. Dear God, let them be on that train. Now. Doctor! No! <coughs> She was always there, always strong, sure, beautiful. She dressed the stump of the arm when I couldn't bear to look at it myself. She held me as I learned to walk all over again, to regain the sense of balance that's destroyed with the loss of the arm. As the days went into weeks, she was always there, always sure. You are much better now. Because of you? <laughs> no, I knew you would be better. How did you know? Because I prayed and had faith. Is it as simple as that? Yes. <laughs> Do you always pray? Yes. Even when you go fishing, do you pray you catch fish? <laughs> no, but I pray for faith. And if I have faith, I will catch fish, then I catch them. <laughs> Francoise, mm -hmm? have you faith that I will get home to England someday? Yes, I have faith. Do you have faith that I will come back for you? Yes. I know you will come back. I love you, Francoise. I love you, Jean. Without her, I could not have survived the pain, the waves of self-pity that came over me. Her faith somehow became mine, too. She was my strength when I had none of my own. And as I grew stronger, the desire to get away left me. I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay with her, always. Then one day her father came home with news from the village. What has happened, father? Trouble with the forced labor again. This time more serious. Two Germans have been killed. What will happen? It has happened. You remember the doctor? Of course. He is dead. No. Oh. They dragged him from his office, stood him up against a wall, 
Shot him. Oh, oh Father. But why? What could he have had to do with labor conscription? Nothing. He was merely a prominent citizen of the town. They shot him as an example. There will be others. Will they come here? They will certainly come here. I must go. Yes. But you, monsieur, what about about you? They will not take me. Can you be sure? I am sure. They will never take me. Now, you will excuse me. I will go lie down a while. I am very tired. Of course, monsieur. Jean. I must get ready at once. Yes, I suppose you must. Be brave, as you always are, my darling. Keep your faith. I will be back. I know you will. I know. <coughs> Francoise. Father. 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 Oh. He must have known, Francoise. <laughs> he must have known he was marked to die. <laughs> he said they would never take him. There was nothing to hold her now. We decided that we should go away together. I tried to persuade her that it was too dangerous, but all she would say was that she had faith, and against her faith, nothing could prevail. I stayed in the mill until the sad little funeral was over, and then we set out at dawn the morning after. Francoise did the rowing. I hid under the canvas, for there were German sentries on the bridges we passed under. Shh. Do not move now, my darling. We are coming to a bridge. Can you see the guard? Yes, he is watching me. Be quiet. You there, help! Yes, monsieur? Where are you going? Oh, I am fishing. There is a better place around the bend. Fishing, eh? Perhaps you have a little fish for me on the way back. <laughs> of course, monsieur. And good fishing, Brian. Uh, thank you, monsieur. <laughs> There were more bridges and more sentries and more narrow escapes, but at last, unbelievably, Marseille. And there, as we walked through the streets to the house of Francois's friends, miracle of miracles, a man running, gendarme after him. Darling, Francois, look. It, it, it's O'Connor. O'Connor. I've got to get him. Meet me. I've got to help him. O'Connor! O'Connor! Somehow O'Connor and I managed to escape the police. And that night with Francoise, we took the train for Spain. Unreality piled upon unreality, yet there we were, the three of us. And poor O'Connor with the dull look of a hunted animal still in his eyes. You feel better, O'Connor? I don't know. I've been half balmy, Skip. Can you tell us now about the others? We were separated. I don't know what happened to them. I don't know half that's happened, Skip. It'll be over soon. One stop at the border, a routine inspection of the papers, and we're free. And you two, you're going to be married. Yes. You approve, monsieur? Oh, Yes. All for it. All for it, Francoise. We're at the border. Remember now, we separate. All meet back here in this compartment, right? Yes, Jean. Right, oh. Don't know if we'll make it. Seems too much to expect. We will make it. I have faith. Faith? <laughs> Hold on to it, Francoise. On up for inspection. On up for inspection. Remember, we meet back here. Yes. Form a line. Form a line here. Have your paper, sir. Eh? Form a line. Monsieur? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Mm-hmm. Step along, monsieur. Step along. Oh, yes, sir. You're next. You're mine. Yeah. Right, right, right. Here. Mm-hmm. So, so. Step along, monsieur. Next. Step up, step up, mademoiselle. Yes. Uh, here, monsieur. Mm-hmm. So, so, so. Thank you, monsieur. Next, next. Hey, that girl! There's something wrong in these papers. Quick, get her back! Arrest that girl! (laughs) 
Pardon, madame. Have you seen a young girl come into this compartment? Mm, there was one here a moment ago with gendarmes. Yes. They came to get her things. Her papers were not in order. They took her off. Yes, thank you, madame. Francoise! Francoise! There he goes! Down the long decals! Francoise! Shoot! I must get past! Shoot! 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 The gendarmes were taking me off the train. O'Connor saw them. He ran to divert their attention. Johnny did it for you. He did it for us, Francoise. Oh. I think he loved you too. Oh, <laughs> she leaned against my empty sleeve. And I let her go on crying as the train rushed on those few last hundred yards toward freedom. I knew she was not crying for herself. Not for O'Connor and the stupid, wonderful thing he had done. Not for her father, her brother, or the doctor. Not for the magnificent France she represented. Deep inside, completely within myself, I knew why she wept. This little French girl with the great heart and the great faith. What she was really crying for was the agony of all that was happening in the world. Mm-hmm.